Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for a game review of Ballads and Tales, A Journey of the Brave. This is by Amber Moon Games. It plays uh, one to five players. It is a semi-co-op and cooperative dungeon crawl. You can play as one player playing the game master and the rest of the players playing as the heroes, all players playing as the heroes and AI game master with a number of different campaigns. You can go through these as kind of like a one shot in each of the different campaigns and modules or you can play them throughout in going from one to the next. This game is going to come with 3D elements with all the different characters in the game, uh, different types of 3D bushes and trees and rocks as well as associated characters and of course elements like doors and chests and different unique items that are going to be needed throughout the game and unique events that will happen as well. Set up your character, set up all their stats as well as all their bonuses to the character, unique abilities, crossbows, explosive arrows, chainmail, their bastard sword, and maybe even a cap to go along with it. Battle up against characters like griffins and blobs and harpies and ents and so on and so forth and attempt to get your way through. There's a number of different things you'll be trying to do in each of the different campaigns and each one is more different than the next. We'll take a look at how to set the game up, what comes in the game and how to play, and of course, my review. Let's go. To set up the game Ballads and Tales, the first thing you're going to need is the rule book and you're going to need the adventure book. You'll select an adventure from the module here and there are a variety of different adventures and there are multiple adventure books that you can go ahead and play from if you can pick them up on the campaign, but this is the one that comes with it. So you can play like the talking coin here. And in this book, it details how you set it up. Each of them will refer to different tiles and what side and where you're going to be placing them as well as any items like trees and bushes and rocks you'll be placing there. Hidden enemies, revealed enemies, your starting campfire, which is where your players begin, and any unique aspects to the campaign uh, will be on the left-hand side, which illustrates the challenge, basically what you're trying to do, what your hidden enemies are going to look like, your difficulty level if you want to increase it, uh, the cards of evil, and your hero equipment, as well as bonuses like hero gold to start out with. And then this is the main core of the game. Uh, to set it up after you've placed everything down based on the campaign, all the different like pieces of um, cardboard, you'll be setting up the uh, different like world for the game, as well as the characters. I like to place all my monsters on the left hand side and all my quests and the items on the other side. You'll have your treasure deck, your event deck, whether it's co-op or competitive, uh, your trader deck, your boss, if there's going to be a boss, as well as spell cards, resources, and abilities. I've also placed my cues, which I'll use for my items, and my dice. Each character is also going to be getting their main card, their stat card, any specific abilities they have, like the Paladin's Blessed, whereas the Alchemist has the Chemist, Alchemy, and Philosopher's Stone ability. And then, of course, unique spells. Some characters have spells and a spell value. And you'll be able to take spell cards with their value based on what type of spell it is. Paladins can have light, so I have camouflage here. And items. Each character has its own base amount of currency, like the Paladin has five gold in the back of his, his or her card, and you can go ahead and use that five gold, as well as any other bonus gold you'll get for the campaign, and basically gather items. I've got a chain mail, a bastard sword, and a slime stone here. And of course, my, my alchemist here is going to have a crossbow, explosive arrows, Mayfell's hunting cap. Now you're also going to accept this other life total to whatever life total it is. In this case, it's seven with an armor total of zero. And then the bottom there is where you can have status effects like poison, fire, uh, broken, confused, etc., etc. Uh, you're also going to get something cool, which is a fairy. This fairy is going to start with a number of health potions and condition potions that will al alleviate you throughout the game to keep your characters alive and condition free. Uh, and as for setup, basically you're going to just place exactly as you have seen here with unique little numbers associated with different events that can take place in the game. Uh, there's a variety of additional content you won't be using in the game. I've got a bunch of stuff set aside, the different monsters and boards and doors and all that. They're all specifically set for certain scenarios. Um, but yeah, that's the basic idea of it. Take, take your campfire and each player is going to place one of their characters in the campfire location where if you're playing two players, uh, each player is going to get two heroes. If you're playing five, then each of the heroes will get one and then the dungeon master will play as the bad guys. And uh, it just depends on the type of play here. But as for here, I have a two-player setup because I played the two-player, played the four-player, played the five-player with the Dungeon Master. There's a wide variety of stuff going on in this game. Well, 
that's the basic idea for a setup. There's a lot to get into, but once you break it down to individual little like components and campaigns, it's not so bad. Let's go ahead and talk about now how to play. Ballads and Tales is a cooperative or semi-cooperative dungeon crawler. You are going to basically play, be playing as the heroes attempting to complete a mission. And the one here that I had set up from the live stream is the Griffin Hunt, where you're going to be defeating the minions around the Griffin, as well as attempting to try and defeat the Griffin himself. Uh, you will use two actions on your turn, each hero will do so, and then you will pass to the enemy in which they will use the ability to move and attack for each of their characters, or the boss will use boss ability. Before the game begins, the heroes are always going to draw an event card at the beginning of the game, and every round for the first player, and do what it says. It could be an alarm or miasma, things that either benefit the heroes, giving them extra actions, or hurt them in some way, shape, or form, making them take extra damage. And so you'll read that aloud and do what it says, and heroes will choose in which order they go. Heroes have two action points each, and they can do a number of different things. They can open up a chest, they can move their movement speed, they can use one of their weapons. Uh, they, might be, they can use multiple um, abilities more than once in a row. For instance, if I wanted to, I could attack with my Bastard Sword twice, as opposed to uh, moving and fighting or moving and searching. It's really up to you how you use them. There's also certain items that are going to have a ring associated with them, that ring is an action point. So for instance, my crossbow will require one action to take a shot with, and it will also require one action to reload. So it's a very strong item, but because it's very strong, you're going to have to spend two actions in order to not only reload it, but also to shoot it. Uh, enemies are basically going to move their speed. It's always going to be as close to the characters as possible. If you're playing with a GM, they get to kind of decide how the enemies move, and they'll be attacking. Uh, and that's the basic idea of the game. Reveal an event, move your characters, perform your actions, and then the enemies will move their characters and attack. Attacking in this game is fairly unique. Uh, the way it works is the heroes that attack. So for instance, my character who is in melee, he can move um, into melee range. He will actually roll all the dice associated with his melee, his melee stat, his melee bonus for his weapon, and any other bonuses he may have or she and they'll take these die and they will roll them. Then they will check to see the number of swords that they have. The enemy will do the same, taking their dice from defense as far as melee combat goes, and they will roll their dice, and they will take their number of swords and they will compare them at this point. Four to three, four wins, and four will do the difference of one to the player who lost. If you're defending and you do more swords than the attacker, then you will actually do damage to the attacker. Uh, there are also occasions where if it's your turn specifically, you will get bonus to die, or if you do enough damage, you will do bonus damage. Sometimes like the Bastard Sword will let you reroll certain die, so there's all these different little actions that take place that give you bonuses to being able to attack for your combat roll. The Paladin, for instance, is able to get a plus one to his attack period for every single melee combat. Um, and you will actually track health just like uh, most dungeon crawlers. If your character has five health and it takes three damage, you'll actually take life points and you'll track it on the character. If there's multiple characters, I suggest placing the HP in different areas or next to the character on the board to associate which character lost what amount of health. Your characters themselves will also lose HP. Uh, but there's also armor in the game. If you have armor, it's very powerful. It can actually give you a reduction to all damage done by an attack, but will cost you a single armor for each time you do so. If you have no armor, you'll simply take damage in the form of life points. And if you hit zero, your character is knocked out. And how that works is if you go to zero, your character kind of gets removed off the board or laying down. And the only way to bring that character back is to heal them, whether it be by a fairy potion or by somebody else's potion or healing ability. If not, they're simply slain. And the way you lose as the heroes is if every one of your characters has been slain. And the way that the enemy loses is if you as the heroes complete your mission or for whatever campaign it is. And in this case, the griffin hunt is to defeat the griffin and all enemies around. Each enemy has unique passive abilities, whether it be the Harpy's ability to silence players and not allow them to basically do anything as long as they're within three spaces and fail a skill check. Uh, they have the ability to fly over certain locations, uh, certain areas on the board, just like any other dungeon crawler. The board here has uh, red spaces where you cannot go through, but you can shoot through. Um, spaces like trees where you can either see through nor can you move through. 
Uh, there's characters like the uh, end here, which is able to have like a war club and it does extra damage when it actually deals damage or it gives you an extra bonus of on your turn combat. Um, there's also ways to mitigate damage other than just armor. You can actually dodge. If you have the ability to dodge, you'll use either the white or black die and you'll be attempting to roll the dodge symbol. And if you dodge, you simply dodge all damage. It's not as likely. And of course, white is better than black, but it does happen and when it does, it feels really good. Uh, there are treasure chests that you can pull out um, and you can get things like a amulet of the proud eagle. It's something that lets leaves melee without being, um, you may leave melee without having to flee, which when you flee from melee combat, you basically take a free set of damage from the enemy. The enemy gets a free swing on you or you can receive a bonus one to your attack in re combat. Wow, that's really good. Um, or something like a potion of invisibility. There are a variety of different treasures you can get in the game. Some are definitely better than others, and hopefully you draw well. And that's the basic idea of the game. Take two actions per character, having each player take out their turns. Then the enemy goes, and then you'll draw your next event and rinse and repeat, playing whatever challenge it is that you're going to be attempting uh, for the game, Ballads and Tales. This is Ballads and Tales. It's a game I reviewed about a year ago uh, when they did their campaign. And this is basically that game with a bunch of extra content added. And I mean a bunch, there's more heroes, there's more enemies, there's more boards, there's more adventures. Um, there's additional components to the game. Characters have additional boards that you can utilize. There's the fairy that gives you bonus to your HP and your conditions. There's more tokens, uh, literally just more of everything. Uh, same thing stands as far as the art goes. The art is brilliant, beautiful style art. This game feels really, really unique. It has that old school feel to it. It has like this oil painting style to it that I simply love. I think it's, it does an excellent, excellent job. It brings me back to like hero quest style game, but with the complexities of a more modern system. Yes, there's luck involved in the game. This is a die rolling, chucking dungeon crawler, but uh, it, it's also very modernized in how it lets you mitigate things with additional items. You will have a buying phase at the beginning of uh, the game, which will allow you to basically pick up any items that you want for your characters and your characters have certain um, allotments they can have. Some characters can't or can have a shield or they can or can't have a bow and there's a list of different items. You have a chunk of items you can pick up from the trader before the game begins when you're choosing your scenario, scenario and setting up your board. And each character can utilize these in certain ways. Uh, there's tokens that will benefit you to uh, understand the game better. I mean, you have like reloading tokens. So it'll explain, okay, your weapon needs to be reloaded. Okay, now it's good to go. I love the fairy. I think the fairy was a great addition to the game. Um, overall, the art style of game. If you're looking for a dice chucking dungeon crawler with this classic, beautiful art feel, this is, go no further. It does exactly what you're looking for it to do. Now, this obviously doesn't have minis. This has standees, um, but everything is 3D in the game. It looks really good. It's layered. It feels good. The art looks great. Um, like I said before, I think too, like during for my top down, it's obviously harder to see, but looking across on the board, it's just fine. It looks great. The artwork stands out. They're double-sided, which is exactly what I want for all my standees. It gets very annoying when I have acrylic standees or the wooden ones that only have one side. And this doesn't do that. This has all the color surrounded. It looks and feels like a location that you would be playing a dungeon crawler in. And all the art surrounding it also fits that theme as well. This is basically just more, more of what I would, would want, more of what I like when it comes to dungeon crawlers, more beautiful artwork, more characters, more customization. Pretty much everything about that campaign was just a stronger feel. It's just a little bit more streamlined. The rule book is a little more simplified to understand, but still has all the complexities of the original game, uh, as well as the bonuses that will allow you to gain more power throughout the game. It's also a challenging game. If you watch my playthrough, oh, we lost because we didn't set up our team correctly. You have to set up your team when going into these missions and kind of prepare for whatever it is that you're gonna fight. You're gonna fight against some units that do not like to deal with um, ranged. You'll need to set up a ranged team with maybe a tank or somebody who can kind of assist your uh, ranged players. Maybe you're going into a head-on assault against characters that are really weak to melee and you wanna build a strong melee team and you can kind of combine the items and mix and match with the trader. Even items that I picked up, I realized, oh, 
this cost me. This was an item that was expensive and I really just didn't utilize it as much as I like. Or a spell that I picked up like camouflage. I shouldn't have picked this up. I didn't use it. My character was melee and I wanted to grab the aggro. This basically lets me hide. So there's all these little cool things I liked. I liked losing and feeling like I was going to be able to do better next time. And I knew the route in which I could take to get a better result. Even if my die rolls were good or bad, it was still irrelevant to that fact. It is the fact of all of the things that I could have mitigated or changed, now I can kind of come back and do so. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot of negatives about the game other than I think the pretty obvious things. Uh, this game is a more complex setup. There is a lot of components. It does not have miniatures. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of customizing before you start the game. Each game scenario roughly takes about an hour. However, the setup and teardown and all that is going to be all associated in there to probably double the time. So you're going to have a big setup. Uh, the, while the rules are fairly simple, you take two actions with your character. The next player does so. Rinse and repeat until the enemy takes their actions where they move and take an action, which is usually just to attack. Uh, and then you rinse and repeat. There is a lot of other little things you can do, whether it be trading items or pulling out chests, how combat works, while not complex, does require you to go consistently and be like, okay, I need this die, this die, and this die, I gotta roll these. And so there is some um, mechanical aspects to the game, but you're gonna find that with pretty much every dungeon crawl you're ever gonna associate yourself with. And there's of course the complexity of setting up and tearing down. But minus that, for those of you who like these type of games, I don't think you're gonna find any problem with that. If you like the old school art style, the kind of canvas oil painting, um, I'd say like 90, early 90s, like late 80s kind of style artwork, hero quests, then the uh, Paladin Tales is gonna be definitely for you. Overall, a fun experience. Uh, what I really loved about it, my favorite aspect is playing it, experiencing it even both times with this new game uh, and realizing how I could do better and how I can improve. And I think that gives top marks for me for a dungeon crawler. So if you're interested, there's a link down below in the description. The campaign is going on right now. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Ballads and Tales. If you're looking for this game, there's a link down below in the description for you to pick up on Kickstarter. There's so many updates and upgrades to this game. I just couldn't get into all of it, guys. But let me just tell you, there is a whole lot. All the different treasures and trader items. And there's just so much. I'm going to do a lot of B-roll for this to show you just what is in this game and what you're going to be able to utilize in Ballads and Tales for you to get a good sense of whether this is for you or not. Check out the live stream. We do a live stream. We did one for this game here on Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. We play games just like this one here. We did, in fact. And, of course, check out our Whatnots on Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. PST. Thank you guys so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel if you think we've earned if you watch more than one of our videos here. And as always, I look forward to delving into some new ballads and tales with you guys next time.